I'm currently speaking to you from a cab in a police car. And the pigs are being herded off to the kill floor. They should be shown mercy, not being herded to the gas chambers. Show some mercy, save the pigs. Call Fearmans, everybody, please call Fearmans. We have to take it while we're driving, though. Mm -hmm. You can't have it while you're driving. You are currently in custody, which means you don't get any possessions. Okay, I, I okay? understand, I understand. Thank sir. you. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. It's Emily from Bite Size Vegan, and welcome to another Vegan Nugget. November 1st, 2016 marked the 22nd year of celebrating World Vegan Day, and appropriately enough, the resumption of the criminal trial in Canada that's thrust animal rights and veganism onto the international stage. Animal activist and co-founder of Toronto Pig Save, Anita Kreintz, is facing six months in jail and a $5,000 fine for giving water to thirsty pigs on their way to slaughter. For more details on the incident itself, please see my interview with Anita from January 2016, linked in the sidebar and below. Just prior to the November 1st court date, I spoke with Anita and James, another key organizer for Toronto Pig Save and the man behind Twitter's Veganoso, about the trial's proceedings and impact thus far. The defense in this case, led by vegan lawyers Gary Grill and James Silver, has taken a unique approach. The key defense that we're using is the, the, the idea that everyone has a duty to bear witness. That's our defense. Right at the beginning when, when I testified, I said our mission is to create a nonviolent vegan world, to promote the idea that everybody has a duty to bear witness, and to promote a cultural shift so that people no longer think it's okay to say, I don't want to see, it's too hard, uh, it might change how I eat. Um, and then people say, that's an acceptable answer. We want to actually promote a cultural shift where people say that I want to uh, live up to my duty to bear witness, I want to bear witness. And the way we're sort of presenting it is that as animal lovers, we're willing to suffer and willing to sacrifice in order to promote social change. So saying something like, oh, it's too hard to look or I'm going to have an emotional big breakdown, that's okay. It's actually okay to suffer in order to help animals because the history of social change has, has occurred because of that. And people like Leo Tolstoy and Mahatma Gandhi tried to re redefine or reinterpret the notions of self-sacrifice and suffering because that's how social change happens. At our trial, when we talk about animals, we talk about animals as individuals and not as property. I mean, the classic sort of line from the driver in this incident was, they're not human. When I said, you know, if they're thirsty, give them water. And he said, they're not human. And if it was a dog in a hot car, it would be a duty to help that dog, to break the window, to let the dog out. So there's no fundamental difference between a dog and a pig, so why, why would there be a different standard on, on how you treat pigs? This is not just a convenient analogy. The same year Anita was charged for giving water to dehydrated pigs, a woman in British Columbia was sentenced to jail for the death of six dogs she left in her truck on a hot day. The truck driver who confronted Anita was hauling 190 pigs in severe heat without any access to water or adequate ventilation. That year in Canada alone, 14,212 pigs died on their way to slaughter. And, we, and then we quoted Tolstoy saying, when we wish to harm others, we really do evil to ourselves. And that, that one line sort of brings together the, all the arguments that we had. So there's a unity of life, we're all equal, animals are individuals, just like we are, and deserve respect and love. And if we don't treat them that way, we're hurting animals, but we're also going to destroy the planet. I asked Anita and James to share any memorable or powerful moments from the trial thus far. There were a number of memorable times in the court. Like I, I think when my lawyer, vegan lawyer, James Silver, cross-examined um, the truck driver, Jeff, he was able to establish the real motivation for charging me. And that was that they wanted to shut us down. So he established that how much money the industry makes and how much that factory farm makes what were the discussions and, you know, why were they concerned about us? Yes, he wasn't concerned about what was in the water or that I gave water to because I offered him a free sample. Or what was really behind this was the motivation that um, we were hurting the bottom line of the industry. It was like it's such an incredible moment, you know, the truth was revealed. And then another amazing moment was when he cross-examined the farmer, Mr. Van Boykel, about how the sows were treated. And I 
got like some of the most heartbreaking moments because he talked about how he had hundreds of sows and they were in these crates where they can't turn around their babies were taken away and then they were put back into a general pen and then within five or six days they were re-impregnated and then again like so their life was a constant cycle it was just heartbreaking and there were so many moments that that were very revealing me when i testified there were a lot of moments that i found very memorable because i was able to say what i really thought and believed what really got me was we were able to show the pig preserve video it just shows who pigs are it was like a 13 minute video having listened to these guys for about 26 years i think they have about 40 different vocalizations but they combine those with body language and so a different vocalization with one body language is different from the same vocalization with a different body language. And I think when you combine the two, they've probably got a vocabulary amongst themselves of, of probably 100, 120, 150 different communications. Oh, Dad. Yeah, I know. <laughs> this is my happy pig. I'm a happy pig. So they do this, it seems that he's very happy. Oh, yeah. He's so happy to have all this space. Grunt, grunt. So, in regard to being like in a factory farm, this space is, you know, the type of space that pigs would, in the wild, be roaming in. Really, would you say? Well, yeah. If yeah. you if you understand it, in in, in truly in the wild, mm. these are nomadic animals. This is just a good lifestyle for a pig. This is the lifestyle that they were meant to meant to live. Yeah. Um, typically when I put a pig down, I give the group an hour or so, mm. and they'll come up usually one at a time to say their goodbyes. Why? And, but it, but it varies from social group to social group, but they all do mourn. When, when they come up, they come up to the pig that is... They nose them all around and they talk to them and try Aww. to get them up. I was just so happy we got to show that. And then after that, we showed footage of the gas chamber. To me, like the truth, we're telling the truth. And so for me, those were high points. Uh, I think for me, like the whole case has just been so captivating. The in level of interest, like every day, the, the courthouse has been packed. There's been people waiting outside trying to get in. In terms of content, just the lack of emotion and lack of uh, empathy from their side is, is being quite disturbing because they're watching the same images that we're seeing on the screens and the disconnect I think is so strong with people who work in the industry it's not really Mr. Van Boykel and uh, maybe 10 or 10 or so farmers came to my, my trial date when I testified it was packed courtroom people were sitting on the floor and people were watching the farmers and you know sometimes they were sort of like sort of joking about yeah, it, things like that but when the pig preserve video was shown who pigs really are like they were paying attention so it was Richard Hoyle he's an ex-marine and pigs were shown in a different light of who they really are. And I think it touched some of them. I believe that this pig trial is touching some of them. The pig trial was presenting the truth. And at the end of the day, that's what's gonna change the world. And I know, I believe we even touched the factory farming industry. And there was one article in Animal Ag magazine that said, Mr. Van Boykel is fighting this alone. Where's the pork council? You know, where are they? And I think this is such a strong case that they have a lot of trouble defending. That's the incredible thing about this trial. It has managed to place the prosecution on the defense and the rights and individuality of non-human animals at the center of debate. Anita's lawyers have called a handful of expert witnesses throughout the trial so far. Well, Dr. May is a veterinarian and she was the first expert witness to testify. And one of the most revealing parts of her testimony was uh, she looked at the video where I gave water to the pigs and then she counted the number of pants and she said the pigs, some of the pigs were panting at 200 pants per, per minute. She said they were in severe distress. On November 1st, we have two expert witnesses, Dr. Lori Marino, and she's going to talk about pig personality, intelligence, sentience. Uh, she's a foremost cognitive behavioralist. Uh, then we have uh, Dr. David Jenkins. He's a professor at the University of Toronto, and he invented the glycemic index, and he's an outspoken vegan. And he will be talking about the health benefits of a plant-based diet and the incredible health impacts of eating meat, dairy, and eggs. And then finally, on November 10, we will have our expert witness on the environment, um, Dr. Tony Weiss, who's a professor of geography at the University of Western Ontario, and he's going to talk about the impact of animal agriculture on climate change, ocean dead zones, deforestation, species extinction, water use, and water pollution, and other issues. 
The pig trial has drawn the attention and support of celebrities like vegan musician, DJ, photographer, and animal activist Moby, actress and model Maggie Q, who stood in solidarity with Anita on November 1st. The most important thing that we're promoting today um, when it comes to Anita's case is that compassion is not a crime. That's what it says on my shirt. And the founder of PETA, Ingrid Newkirk, who has flown out to Toronto for the trial to show her support. Five million of our members and supporters are watching Burlington and want to know what's happening. We think of kindness as a virtue, not as something to be punished. The broad exposure of the pig trial speaks to the two primary goals of the SAVE movement, to bear witness to the individuals suffering in the trucks and to document the experience to share with the world. Having myself attended a number of vigils with Toronto Pig Save and Manchester and Essex Pig Saves in the UK, I can personally attest to the incredible impact of bearing witness and publishing the images for the world to see. They're being slapped right now. We want people to see what we see, and when we look inside a truck, we see individuals, pigs, cows, and chickens who want to live. When you show the victims, when you see their faces, and you look in their eyes, and you see them as individuals, it really helps people connect and have empathy. When any of us are at vigils, and we go up to the pigs, or the cows and chickens, and bear witness, we have a camera in hand. So we're there for the individual, we're present. We're saying we love you, we're sorry, we see the individual before us, but we also have a camera in hand because we're trying to change the world, and we're thinking about broader issues as well. Like because of the pig trial, we're getting these images in the mainstream media. They even looped the video of the incident when I was charged from June 2015 on mainstream television. Two days after Anita's testimony at trial, a truck overturned outside of Fearman's Pork, the slaughterhouse at which Anita was charged. We'll hear more about the actual event later in this video. Anita spoke to the effect of the crash on the media. There's been learning in the media. I think the media has gone more and more sympathetic as the case, as, as the big trial has gone on. And then, you know, when we had that horrible crash, a few days after I testified at the pig trial, just had unprecedented coverage. Because usually the coverage is either to ignore it or to say no one was hurt if the driver wasn't hurt. And this time the media was there and I think there was incredible learning. We, we told all our activists, go to the site and document. See, if that pig crash happened and there were no activists that went on site, it would not have been as big a story and not as re it wouldn't be reported as sympathetically. One re news reporter said that she, this incident had changed her life and that she wants to go vegan. And There was another camera person from a huge television station that said he, he said he was vegan and his whole family was vegan. So... I think we're definitely, the vegan movement is spreading in the mass media, and it just, it's just an indication that it's spreading across all sectors of society. The pig trial has managed to elicit support and empathy even from meat eaters. I asked Anita and James why this case is reaching people when nothing else has. By and large, the public is sympathetic. It's, you know, it's the idea of like defending the golden rule. So you treat others as you'd like to be treated. Leo Tolstoy said uh, we should take pity on animals the same way we take pity on each other if we are not to deaden the voice of conscience. So people understand and across cultures, and you know, the golden rule is thousands of years old. So, so the animal agricultural industry cannot fight the golden rule. And that's what they tried to do, and it's backfired. While Toronto Pig Save has been holding vigils and posting images of animals on their way to slaughter for five years now, this is the first time they've gained international coverage, and with an impressive reach and momentum at that. Anita and James spoke to what they saw as the driving force behind this growth. First of all, the incident in and of itself is a, it's like the best top possible incident you can charge someone on, like giving water to a thirsty animal. So yes, like let's look at that, you know, that's an incredible incident. But the, the other factor is the fact that we are organized. You know, the reason this is so big is because there's a social movement here. It's not just some random woman who gave water to thirsty pigs and was charged. No, they charged an organizer they charge an organizer as part of an organizing team that's across Toronto. And now there's a global movement. There's like almost 90 SAVE groups around the world. 21 new SAVE groups started in the United Kingdom. We have people like grandmothers, babies. We have a, hundreds of people that come to, to our all-day vigils. Like our biggest vigil was when you, Bites Eye Vegan, first came to one of our vigils. That was our biggest vigil back in September 24, 2015. We had like, on that day, we had almost 300 people. 
So that was our biggest vigil to date. Since then, we've you know we've grown and grown and grown. You know that's the reason we're getting great coverage. And I think it has to do with also with the trial. A trial is something that the media can report on. It's hard for them to just cover our vigils. We've been doing this for more than five years. Why are we getting mainstream media coverage now? Why are we getting international coverage? It had to do with the trial. So now our images are getting out there, the ones that we've had all this time. At the end of the day, the news coverage was that this pig trial put animal agriculture on trial. Uh, sometimes it's almost like you forget that it's an e-tron trial because the whole sense of it's almost they're having to defend the truth of what they do and because it's just so important. In our global society, there is a profound reversal of right and wrong surrounding our food system. Eating a vegan diet is viewed as extreme. Animal lovers readily consume the bodies of sentient beings whom they would not be able to bring themselves to harm. A horrifically clear example of the laws protecting the criminal whilst criminalizing those fighting to save the victims came on October 5th, 2016, the day the truck crashed at Fearman's. Anita, fresh from her testimony in court two days before, was promptly arrested again, not long after her arrival at the scene. She had refused to step back from documenting the incident. I asked James to share some of his experience. He alludes to a pig named Bonnie, whose story you can hear more in depth in the video on the crash, linked in the sidebar and below. It was so intense. As soon as I parked my car and got out, you could hear the pigs screaming. There was blood on the on the sidewalk. Uh, some pigs had escaped. In my naivety, I expected to find people uh, helping the pigs, and that wasn't that wasn't happening. There were people, office workers, holding cardboard to shield the truth from us. The, the cops were complicit in that. It got worse after Anita left. I don't know what they're called, but like special unit cops arrived. They're like tasers, and it was it was all around hiding the truth. We didn't see this, so we don't know, but no injured pigs came off the truck, so they must have killed a lot of pigs. Because when I got there, the screaming was the worst screaming, and we hear horrific screaming every single week. It was the worst screaming I've ever heard, and they walked, uh, was it 40 or 50 pigs, they walked off the truck, they, they shot Bonnie in front of us, but there were no other injured pigs, so I strongly suspect they killed a lot of pigs on the truck because there was a lot, all, all that screaming suddenly stopped. Yeah. I mean, people are compassionate and people have empathy, and that this is why animal agriculture spends so much time and money and effort into shielding the truth, because if people knew what was happening, they would make the change and they would go vegan. They would not support and pay for this to happen. And that's precisely what the pig trial is accomplishing. In reality, it's not so much that Anita or her lawyers or Toronto Pig Save came up with some revolutionary argument never before voiced by animal activists. When it comes to veganism and the rights, emotions, individuality, and capacity to suffer of non-human animals, it's not a lack of compelling evidence, but rather a lack of a large enough platform that hinders the reach of the message. And unbeknownst to the truck driver and farmer on that oppressively hot day in June 2015, by confronting and having Anita charged, they supplied that platform. For the animal products industry, so desperately reliant on deception and untruths, there's nothing more dangerous than giving the voice of the animals they systematically abuse and kill an international stage for their truth to be heard. It's time to expose the real crimes and the real criminals. Please share this video far and wide to raise awareness and give it a thumbs up if you're moved by these events. Subscribe to the channel for more vegan content every week. To help support Bite Size Vegan's educational efforts, please see the support links below or in the sidebar. Find more information about the trial, the crash, and additional resources on the blog post for this video linked below. Now go live vegan, speak the truth, and I'll see you soon. He was supposed to be slaughtered for Christmas dinner about four years ago, but some people rescued him and got him here. Happy Christmas.